Let me just try and add a couple of things. I mean, I think Jean's quite right when she says that the government's a bit like an octopus. Uh, it's also, I think, though, where it differs a bit is that an octopus does have a single core brain. And uh, people tend to assume that government has a grand plan. If they don't like it, it's a conspiracy. If they do like it, it's a positive policy or initiative. But that's, in my experience, that's not often how it works. And in theory, that's how it works. In theory, it's headed up by a cabinet and a premier or prime minister, and that's the core brain. But in fact, that's not how it really works. That it's just too big. That people in different departments don't have a clue what each other's doing. Frequently, people within the same departments don't have a clue what each other is doing. And in my experience, people even, uh, even down the hall and sometimes in the next desk don't have a clue what each other is doing. One of the interesting things we did when, when I was with uh, Chief of Staff to uh, uh, Ron Irwin as Federal Minister of Indian Affairs, started having these kind of private dinners between the minister and departmental officials. And they were from secretaries up to directors general. And just get a dozen people together and went off with the minister for dinner. And one of the things that immediately discovered was he had to introduce each, the people to each other. And then he had to ask, ask them all, well, what do you do? And all the people said, oh, is that what you do? Is that what you do? All right, well, it's nice to meet you. And, and how long have you been in the department? Oh, 20 years and 18 years. <laughs> they never met each other. Uh, and this is sometimes even people within the kind of the same branch of the department. So there's not that kind of coordinated uh, reality. Now, it doesn't mean the governments don't have broad policies of brush strokes. They do. But it just doesn't always, always translate into this plan. Similarly, if you talk to one official, that does not mean that you've talked to government. Even if you've talked to, a deputy, to some of the deputy ministers who are here, it doesn't mean that you've talked to the government. It doesn't even necessarily mean you've talked to their department. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that their views will be reflected by their, all of their own officials, uh, let alone in other departments. So it is truly kind of multi-headed. I also agree with, with Gene that it's important to... Uh, to keep in mind that uh, the government does consist, in a sense, really, it's just like the people here. They're human, flesh, blood people. Uh, they're not the government, each one of them. They may work for the government, but they have their own views and beliefs, uh, their own desires. They cry, they laugh. Uh, they've all, all been born, they're all going to die. Right? That's reality, just like everybody else in the room. So uh, appreciate that as individuals, they sometimes uh, completely endorse what, what they're doing and what their government is doing, and then uh, at other times they don't. The, the political part of government come and go. Ministers come and go, parties come and go, in power, out of power. Public service generally remains. So that they're not, and we see the shifts to governments. Politically, their policies take. Well, the public service is their job to carry out, in theory at least, what the what the ministers and the party in power of the day believe. So that sometimes they're going to like uh, what their directions are, sometimes they're not. Uh, similarly, though, of course, don't assume that all decisions are made either by ministers or by senior officials. In my experience, neither is remotely true. Uh, ministers come in, come in expecting that they now are in charge. They make a decision and it will be done. Nah, sometimes, but often not. Uh, similarly, though, frankly, for senior officials, it doesn't mean it's done in the field. It doesn't mean that the individual minister, you know, ministry of natural resources person uh, out in the field or on the lake is going to be doing precisely what the policy coming out of uh, Toronto or Winnipeg or Edmonton or Saskatoon or Ottawa says, right? Uh, that's just not kind of the reality of it. Uh, let me su suggest a, a, just a couple quick things, because I, I want to hear other people talk. One uh, flip side of that is the uh, political leadership, I think, of Métis organizations have got to stop mouthing rhetoric and slogans. They've got to speak to substance. They've got to stop just speaking to their own supporters uh, who put them in office. They've also got to be talking to the public in general, and they've got to be talking to governments in terms of addressing the tough questions. They've got to be building a base with solid answers for those tough questions and solid strategies, uh, so as to overcome government fears. The kinds of statistics uh, the, that Andy and Evelyn ran through, those scare the hell out of people in most governments. Uh, they see an exploding Métis population. 
And the immediate response to that is to kind of hear, uh, you know, for the old cash registers, the dollar signs, you know, the sounds, the bell ringing as the money is going up. Now, I'm not saying that that is true, but that's a kind of an instinctive response. Similarly, it means, well, who are the, who are the Métis question? Suddenly now there are 100,000 more people than there were five years ago for whom this question is, it raises it concerns in governments. So that, that is real. Solutions have to be coming forward to that. <clears throat> the flip side of that also is the governments have to confront a rights agenda. And on Métis, it's just not been there. The thrust has always been on program socioeconomic needs. Now, that's not that they're unimportant. They're vital. You know, you've got to have food on the table to survive to the next day. But those are easier for governments to deal with. They're easier to deal with, particularly in a pan-Aboriginal sense, off reserves, to be able to deal with them. You don't have to worry so much about uh, boundaries and definitions. Uh, and they're also less threatening. Programs are something that governments are comfortable with, cause, in part because they know they come and they go. They can shrink, they can expand. There's maximum government flexibility when it comes to dealing with programs and services. You can alter them to some extent at will. Rights agenda is a whole different uh, universe. Uh, we've been seeing that on the First Nations side over the last 20 years. We're just perhaps about to start seeing it on the Métis side. But, that, but for governments to overcome their fears and be able to come to grips with the rights agenda, they need to be having pathways set out for them. And that's where I come back, I think, to some of the challenges for Métis leaders and organizations, is to have kind of clear objectives and solutions that address some of those government fears. If not, uh, it's tough to have a real meaningful negotiation as opposed to dialogue or discussion to really get into negotiation. And if we don't do that, then, well, people say, well, it's litigation. But as Gene says, it's last resort. And furthermore, the outcome that the courts have been telling us generally in litigation, no matter who wins, is, okay, now go off and negotiate this stuff. Leave the judges say, you know, leave us alone. Leave us out of it. This is political. We've got to make a decision we do. We'll make it. Here's, here's a new yardstick, but now go off and negotiate. So it still means getting us back to where we should be anyway.